In part one of Picturewise, available on the Criterion release of A Hard Day's Night, director Richard Lester talked about how he adapted the multiple camera approach of live TV to his film work. How to get three cameras on a scene and get a variety of shots so that you could always change the tempo and readjust it to the rhythm that the scene needs to play. If you're on one camera and somebody else is on the closer thing and say, on take one, just start with the hands and then go up and see what you get up there. I'll cover the wide shot and then I'll start on the glass. And then out of three or four takes, the three cameras have produced a myriad of different ways to cover that scene. And you've only wasted the energy of the actors three times. So you're getting, normally speaking, the best out of them. And he revealed how his working methods were born from the necessity for speed. Most of the work that I did, there wasn't time to work out a philosophy. I think it was, here is an offer, here is the problem. How is the easiest way to solve this? And to give that sense of exuberance that I think is necessary. In part two, we looked at Lester's groundbreaking 60s films, which combined slapstick, social observation, and new wave playfulness. Now, in part three, we consider Lester's later work, which has been seriously neglected of late. Lester's 70s films deal with heroism, which they regard with a sceptical, ironic eye. But before he could begin this new phase, he had four years in the wilderness. He filled the time directing commercials, which had always been a useful sideline. This Havana aroma drives them crazy. In 1973, he returned in triumph with a two-part adaptation of The Three Musketeers. It's the only version to capture the cynicism of the book. <laughs> no! Get into me! Lester blended two styles, a rough-and-ready improvised approach for the Musketeers' fights, and elegant symmetry for the scenes at court. Uh, Queen to King's Nightfall. Aranwith Castle. It is a perfect architectural gem and then putting the dogs playing chess, which is another symmetrical bit. It's nice. What was wonderful is being given the book, and they didn't have the sense to rip out the, and only give you what everybody knows, which is basically the Queen's Diamond. Intended as a three-hour roadshow picture, the film ended up released as two separate films, with the second part notably darker than the first. It's such a logical and interesting progression of the whole book, which gets darker and darker and more melodramatic. And if the films are shown simultaneously, they do work quite well, where the lightness just falls away and the whole religious wars and the politics and the intrigues and the murders really pay off. They were in serious trouble. They had fired two directors and had committed themselves to the 18 days of that cruise that they'd bought. So I think David Pickard turned to me in a cry for help, as it were. But I loved the story. The film works both as a thriller and as an examination of how governments deal with terrorism. The passengers and crew of the Britannic form a microcosm and a time capsule of British life in the early 70s. A multicultural, class-ridden tub turning in endless circles. To demonstrate my skill and sincerity, I have arranged a small demonstration which should occur as I am speaking to you. I trust this will cause no serious personal injury. The success of Musketeers led to more period movies. In Royal Flash, Malcolm McDowell plays a war hero who's really a coward, bully, lecher and crook, a one-man exemplar of Victorian hypocrisy. Lester was able to combine economy with his love of fast-paced action. 
by shooting the film at 21 frames per second, I can make everybody move that little bit sharper to just give them that edge that makes all that energy come through. And we shot the whole film on 21 frames. That's 8% less film stock and we came in under budget. God keep you well. Robin and Marion is a far more somber film. The love story is affecting, but Lester, typically, is more concerned with other aspects. Basically, it's the death of Robin Hood, which was the original title. It's about so much more than their relationship. The Robert Shaw character, the man who taught himself to read and write, and who was becoming interested in the people that he was the sheriff over, and Robin Hood, unaware of the legend, and then suddenly deciding he's got to live the legend and not knowing how. The idea of myth and legend and reality all of those elements are the things that I found really very, very interesting. And I knew I shouldn't do a Western, and so Butch and Sundance, I, I just kept saying to myself, it's a Victorian melodrama. Butch and Sundance, the early days, brought Lester back to America for a prequel that combined action with historical accuracy and played against Western stereotypes. Lester was after authenticity, which meant showing that the hyperbolic gunplay of the average otter was pure fantasy, because bullets cost money. Slow. I wanted right at the beginning to know that this is not going to be a thing where you go fire, fire and bang and shoot it off. You know, he knows that he can't afford more than a dozen bullets. And he knows that compared to the price of a washing machine that he should bring home to his wife. Hey! Bobby, let Sam be Sundance for a while. You be Cassidy. I don't want to be Cassidy. Oh, that's a hell of a note. My own kids. Lester ended this second phase of his career with a movie that seemed to invert the usual balance of foreground and background. He had always used the social milieu of his films to undercut the romantic stories. In Cuba, his fragmentary montage depicts a society in revolution, which entirely upstages the ineffectual hero. I started off trying to imagine what it would be like having a country run by the American mafia and Batista, who was an idiot, who had been deposed several times in the past and always came back and made the cover of Time magazine each time he returned, to suddenly having, out of accident, people who won, but not even having any lorries to take them into the capital. I mean, they had to borrow farm vehicles and drive in. They had no plan of winning. Over that weekend, Havana is transformed into a totally different place you end up making a very, very interesting documentary about a bunch of extras. Or you invent a character who thinks his instincts are right, who finds he's fighting on the wrong side and doesn't have the intelligence to know what to do about it, and give it to Sean Connery. And Sean only, I think, recognized very late that he was playing for the first time in his life a thoroughly insensitive and stupid man with a not very good hairpiece. Lester then accepted an offer to help as producer on an embattled mega production. They came to me on their knees to say, can you help keep this thing together because the director is not talking to us and we don't want to talk to him. Lester commissioned a second model unit to help with the elaborate special effects climax. 
So I went round between the two of them smiling. And the only other person on the unit that was smiling was Marlon Brando because he was paid a million dollars for a few minutes work. Be safe here, son. And they all kept saying, isn't he nice? The success of Superman resulted in Lester taking over the sequel, part of which had already been shot, and then directing Superman 3 in its entirety. He tried to use the third film to question and satirize heroism the way his movies of the previous decade had done. And that didn't work. My jokes come out of a kind of social realism, and I don't know how much it costs Lois Lane to buy a pair of shoes in Metropolis, or what her rent is. And I kept saying that to people, saying, I, I don't get this kind of fantasy, because I think the attempts to make it realistic and the attempts that have a good and a bad side of Superman are, relatively speaking, puerile. <laughs>